There's a new post on Facebook that supposedly reveals the Cybertruck price. And this time it is not an anonymous post. There's a name uh, here and it says that the tri-motor is basically $99,000. FSD pricing is honored at $7,000 and that the wrap uh, would be $11,000 for the car, which is self-healing. So that's basically uh, the same kind of wrap uh, that Tesla has recently started offering for other vehicles. There's no information about the dual motor and the guy is not from Texas, which is a bit interesting because you would think that all of the first customers would probably be uh, from Texas. And then he says that he does not know what the range is going to be. It sounds a bit strange that someone would know the price, but not the range. The information though does match the previous post, the anonymous post that we saw before. If Tesla wants to minimize their losses and maximize revenue from the Sabotrek in the beginning, it does make sense to start selling it at a very, very high price in the beginning and then as demand becomes lower, then cut the prices. But here's a counter argument to why these prices may be false. I believe these prices to be false because mid-July after it was announced, Ford was slashing prices for the Lightning. Elon Musk stated on Next that he thought the Lightning was somewhat expensive, uh, says Shane. And at the time, the Lightning was pretty pricey, $98,000 for the top trim which dropped to $92,000 and uh, yeah Elon made this public comment which uh, looked pretty bullish for the Sabotrek at least in the long term certainly. I don't think it matters a lot what the price specifically is for the tri-motor Sabotrek but I think it does matter a lot what the price is going to be for the dual motor. I think that one is going to be the more popular version and I think most people are expecting that to be under $80,000. Because if it's over that, then Tesla customers would not be able to get the $7,500 EV tax credit from the government. But generally speaking, before these leaks, everyone uh, mostly thought that the Cybertruck would be cheaper. And eventually, it will be much cheaper. Just in the beginning, it appears that the price might be quite a bit higher than initially expected. Elon Musk just came up with a really good idea. Any posts that are corrected by community nodes become ineligible for revenue share. The idea is to maximize the incentive for accuracy over sensationalism. I don't think right now it will make a big difference because X pays so little to its creators but later as that becomes more significant this will make a significant difference i think the refresh model 3 can now also be seen in romania drive tesla is reporting that tesla will be increasing the price of the solid black paint option in the u.s next week according to one drive tesla reader who is close to buying a model y uh, they were contacted by their advisor to warn them of the upcoming price change that will see solid black go from $1,500 to $2,000. If this does happen, this would support the further trend of Tesla increasing prices. So many Tesla stock investors will take it as good news. Small news, but good news. The governor of California just visited Giga Shanghai, actually. I'm happy to to see the success of this facility, though we want to compete with this facility. I want more jobs in the United States. I want, uh, I want Tesla to continue to expand and grow. He said more jobs in the US and not more jobs in California. So it does seem to me that he is very interested in becoming the president of the US. Supposedly the backlog is coming back for some Tesla vehicles. However, Sawyer says, I don't think the backlog has changed. The time between now and estimated delivery date is the same as it was in late September. So while the estimated delivery date has moved from November to December to now being December to January, the length of time you have to wait after placing an order uh, for you to get your delivery is basically the same. And Tesla Chan did not say that the backlog is building up. He just said that the estimated delivery date has been extended. Uh, so he didn't mislead anyone, just some people are misinterpreting what he said here. However, the Model X inventory is trending lower. Next year, Wall Street is expecting Tesla's volumes to grow by 22%, but most retail Tesla stock investors that participated in Gary's poll think that 
Tesla will grow between 30 to 40 percent next year. And here's what Wall Street is expecting over the next few years. And the Cybertruck expectations are uh, kind of interesting right here. 160,000 deliveries in 2025. And then actually in 2026, they think Tesla will deliver less, 150,000 and then uh, growth continues after that. I think in 2028, Tesla will deliver substantially more than 220,000 Cybertrucks that Wall Street is expecting Tesla to deliver. Mr. Beast is giving Teslas away. Well, actually, no one took them here. They chose this challenge, but it was very clear that Teslas are $40,000 each. And already in just half a day, 27 million people saw that video. So that's pretty good as far as advertising goes. I wonder if Tesla is actually paying Mr. Beast. I don't think so, but there is a chance. In just one day, the video has now gotten 45 million views. The Tesla Cybertruck Frank will be powered, so that's good. The UAW has reached a new contract agreement with Stellantis, but there is no deal with GM yet. The deal includes a 25% hourly pay raise plus cost of living allowances over the more than four year contracts. Stellantis also agreed to concessions on job security, including keeping an engine plant open in Trenton, Michigan. Well, only as long as they are not bankrupt, which, uh, you know, this agreement is going to accelerate that and building a vehicle in the company's idled Illinois assembly plant. BYD all-electric car sales almost passed Tesla in Q3, but we know that Tesla's factories were shut down. So it is not really a fair comparison. Tesla is in red here, and you can see that BYD is almost higher here, but really uh, what we should look at is this number here, assume that it is a bit higher and that's where Tesla would have been if uh, the factories were not shut down. And someone will say, oh, but that's just an excuse that Tesla's factories were shut down, uh, BYD is beating Tesla. Well, then we would have to look at BYD right here, for example, and say, oh, how come uh, BYD was doing so poorly here? BYD is, well, was on the verge of collapse here because look at the sales. They fell so much right here. It's the same thing, basically. There will always be quarterly fluctuations from time to time. And obviously there is room for more than just one automaker. They are not even really attempting <laughs> to solve full self-driving. They said that basically FSD is uh, impossible. So I am not interested in BYD stock. California said to distribute $40 million to build only 270 fast chargers, that's about one or $50,000 per charger. Tesla supercharger cost is estimated to be about a third of that. Why just not give all of that money to Tesla and let Tesla build all of these superchargers? Such a waste of money. The UAW now has a deal with Ford and Stellantis, but when it comes to GM, the UAW has just expanded its strike against GM. And this facility is the largest manufacturing facility that GM has in North America. And where GM is making the all-electric Lyric, people were seen walking out. Hyundai is running ads calling out the Model 3. Hyundai says that the Model 3 does not have Blue Link connected car service. Here's someone that has an Ionic 5 and says that uh, Blue Link is basically useless. And the way they are advertising here is not exactly very fair. Uh, they say that the Tesla Model 3 does not have 361 miles of range, basically saying, oh, our car has that many miles. I am going to ignore this really weird design for a moment. If you look at their model with the longest range, it is this one, 361 miles of range. That's rear wheel drive. So not all-wheel drive, and if you turn it into an all-wheel drive vehicle, you only get 316 miles of range. And if you go with higher trims, the range actually decreases 270 here for the all-wheel drive models. Tesla's long-range model has 333 miles of range, not to mention that it has a lot more horsepower. The all-wheel drive model long-range will have about twice as much horsepower than the rear-wheel drive 
ionic. So that's really not a fair comparison at all. And they don't even display their 0 to 60 speeds here, probably because they are not really that impressive, at least compared to Tesla. Another problem with some of these legacy automakers is that they lower the upfront payment for you a little bit, but actually they basically require you to buy this expensive mandatory service, which in reality, an EV shouldn't require any service. Service should be very, very little. Tesla does not trick you into paying for unnecessary service later for you just to keep your warranty. One of my favorite TV shows is Friends. Unfortunately, one of the actors has just passed away. Rest in peace, Chandler. Every time I see someone relatively young or not old pass away, it makes me think a lot. And also it makes me want to do a lot more with my life because you never really quite know exactly just how much time you have left. In Europe, supposedly you can get this EV for just $100 per month, roughly. The base model starts at 23, 1300 euros so that's about twenty four and a half thousand dollars but of course the specs are not going to be that impressive the more important question here is how much money will the company be making slash losing from every sale of this ev alexandra says that this is watch of the year bradford says i was skeptical of this but i'm about 30 minutes in and it has been thought provoking Gary Black and this guy disagree pretty much on everything it appears, so this should be pretty interesting to listen to. And Herbert usually chooses his words carefully, and he says that Nicholas Colas is likely the most credible person to speak on Tesla that I know of given his background. So let's take a look at this interview. Nicholas is a 30 plus year veteran of Wall Street with experience in equity research, money management and investment banking. Tesla right now is worth around about $700 billion in terms of total market cap. That's the value of the company. And it's a big value, but it is, I think it's justifiable from a number of perspectives. The way I look at it is twofold. The first is what is the value of any car company on the planet that we are sure is gonna survive the transition to electric vehicles? And to my mind, there's only two, Tesla, obviously. And then the other one is Toyota. I really thought he was going to say BYD, but no. And it's not just me that thinks that. The market cap of Toyota is roughly $300 billion. It's the only other car company in the world that has a market cap consistently over $100 billion. That tells me that the market thinks Toyota will survive. And I happen to agree. I've toured Toyota plants. I know the operating model very well. They are the low-cost producer globally. If Toyota is going to survive this EV transition, why are they then cooperating with BYD to build EVs? I am more confident in BYD than Toyota when it comes to EVs and the future. It also seriously does not help Toyota that they are betting on hydrogen. That's such a waste of money. The way I think about any car company, and for the moment we're gonna treat Tesla like a car company, because for the moment, in terms of recession risk, that's what it is. Um, car companies have to fund their CapEx and have to fund operations even when demand goes down. And it's one of the most critical things about understanding about this industry is when demand declines, car companies start to burn cash very, very quickly. And in Tesla's case, they can't really afford to defer capital expenditures. They have to keep investing and growing the technology side of the business. So they're really in a bit of a tough spot because they have roughly $10 billion a year of CapEx. They can't not to spend that money. And they have roughly $10 billion a year of general operating expenses. And again, they really can't defer any of those. They have to keep investing and growing. So that $26 billion in cash goes away pretty quickly if you start to see declines in demand from a recession. And we'll talk about competitive forces as well, but let's just talk about recession for the moment. Elon's very right to worry about car, a car company in a recession. And he does have PTSD from 08, absolutely. But that's a healthy perspective in this industry. So if demand declines and cash flow begins to go negative from operations, they have have to continue to keep funding everything, particularly the AV side of the business and all the other technology things they're doing. And so I think the wisest thing for Tesla to do right now, while the stock price is still extremely high, is to go out and do a $20 billion equity deal. It's only a 3% dilution to the value of the company. It's basically nothing. EPS numbers get cut only very, very small. So there's really not much 
risks doing it. And by adding another $20 billion, you bulletproof that balance sheet. And the number one thing you have to do as a car company to survive in the near term against any kind of exogenous shock is make sure you have all the cash you need. Look, it's the only reason Ford never went bankrupt. Because in 08, GM and Chrysler did. The Ford family was wise enough to tell the CEO, raise all the cash you can. And that's why Ford is still a public company, still controlled by the family, because they did that. And I think you know, Tesla can take a page out of that book and understand that you really have to be very, very conservative with cash and have as much as you possibly can, not just for the recession risk, but for the risk that the industry develops in an unhealthy way. And we can talk about that next. I can almost hear Gary Black screaming, no, no way. Tesla should do that. Tesla should do a buyback instead. If Elon wanted to raise $20 billion for Tesla, I think that would also send a signal that the next generation vehicle is not coming very soon. I think it would probably freak out quite a few investors if Tesla actually decided to raise $20 billion. While it's only a small percentage of Tesla's market cap, that would sound a negative message, I think, to many investors. I, of course, I wouldn't mind too much because I would just be buying more Tesla stock, probably at cheaper prices because many people will probably just decide to sell Tesla stock. And while in the long term, potentially the returns of Tesla stock would be reduced slightly, the risk would be reduced by a lot more. So if Elon really wanted to do that, I wouldn't really be opposed to it. And the reason why I say if Tesla raises a lot of money, why the next generation vehicle would be delayed is because Tesla would be thinking that uh, maybe there's some sort of an issue with it. Maybe we can produce it as cheaply as we thought before. Capital expenditures will be a lot more than we previously thought. So therefore, we need to raise more money. And when we sell these vehicles, we won't be making money as soon as... Uh, the previously thought. On the other hand, you can also make an argument that's a complete opposite of that, pretty much. Tesla would be raising so much money, which it could now use on the next generation vehicle to actually build it out uh, and make it happen sooner. So there's a possibility that actually that could be somewhat bullish, but I think, at least in the short term, the stock would not respond to it positively. I think it would be quite a negative event. It would also send a message to a lot of investors that Tesla right now thinks the stock is not cheap because otherwise, if they thought the stock was cheap, Tesla would be buying its stock instead of selling its stock to raise money. What was your uh, thinking about what happened in January of this year where they did massive price cuts? The most important thing to understand about the global auto industry is there's 40% more capacity than there is demand. So mm. it varies by product line, but this is a tremendously overcapacitized industry for a whole variety of reasons. But basically capacity doesn't leave the system when companies lose market share. Um, car companies are very important employers in a lot of countries, and a lot of countries don't want to see car companies and shut down plants. And so they give them incentives, they give them, they give them different financial incentives and other social incentives to keep plants open. You know, so for example, GM went bankrupt during the financial crisis and the US government basically bailed them out and helped them out of bankruptcy. Um, that capacity could have left the system, but it didn't. And so we still have more capacity for car production globally than we have demand. That creates a very unhealthy dynamic because you have basically too much supply chasing too too little demand for the capacity that's installed. And that's why the industry has very little returns on capital. So as a result, it's very hard to make a good margin over time in the car industry because it, basically you're competing with way too much capacity. The other issue, and this is particularly topical for electric vehicles, um, and just to give you a little bit of background, there are obviously, as your as your audience knows, mandates for how what percentage of electric vehicles each car company will sell in five or ten years' time in the U.S. and Europe, and there are some mandates in China right now that will no doubt grow. It's a big part of the EV bull story. We've tried this before in the U.S. <clears throat> with something called corporate average fuel economy or CAFE. <clears throat> Excuse me. And what CAFE started to do in the 1970s was mandate how many, what, what average miles per gallon a vehicle fleet had to be. So if a car company wanted to sell cars in the U.S., their corporate average fuel economy had to be, call it, 15 miles per gallon. And it's gone up to 40 and 50 now. That dynamic was supposed to encourage the the sale of small, efficient vehicles. The trouble is gas prices are very low in the U.S. relative to the rest of the world. 
And so you ended up with a situation where small cars, it became very unprofitable. And only the most efficient car companies like Toyota were able to sell small cars at a profit. The domestic car companies slowly receded out of that business to the point where it's almost impossible to buy a passenger car from a U.S. automaker anymore. They just don't make them anymore because they got competed away and out of that business. There's a lesson here for the EV industry, and, and Elon Musk understands this crystal clear. You have to be the low-cost producer in a market where your product is being mandated because consumers have to be attracted to the product enough to buy it versus an alternative. And for the next many years, they will have alternatives. They will be able to buy an ICE vehicle. So if you are a car company selling EVs, you have to be the low-cost producer, and you have to keep cutting price. The two things go hand in hand because you have to pull consumers into your showroom and have them sign for a car. And that takes price and, and nothing else really will do. So as much as there have been price cuts in EVs, there probably will be more. And it's why it's so critical that, you know, Musk and Tesla are very clearly focused on being the low cost producer, because that's the way you survive is being the low cost producer. And the cafe example shows you that if you don't do that, GM, Ford, the old Chrysler, now Stellantis, if you don't do that, if you're not the low cost producer, you will not be able to compete in that marketplace at all. And then that's the death knell for those companies if they can't. It is not often you will see anyone from Wall Street say that Tesla should keep cutting prices instead of focusing a lot on advertising. This interview is certainly a bit thought-provoking and uh, there are quite a few more moments that are quite interesting in it. Tomorrow I will probably continue uh, with a few more clips from the interview. This person just sold Tesla stock and here are my thoughts. That's a new exclusive video that's available on Patreon. I also saw a few more people selling their Tesla stock. Sometimes I see comments on my videos as well. So we need to talk about this. By joining my Patreon, you will get access to how much I think it is fair to pay per Tesla share each year between 2023 and 2033. If you sign up for the investor tier of support, you will also get my valuation model of Tesla stock with a 45 minute video walkthrough. And YouTube says you should watch this video next, but if you haven't finished watching that discussion about the future with Elon Musk, watch this one first. My name is Matt Posius. Make sure to like and subscribe if you haven't yet, and I will see you in the next video. Thank you so much for watching.